All right, let's try and get started. Uh, so in the future, um, try to stop by and talk to Sue and make sure that uh, he has you marked off for being here. Um, and we, we may go through various mechanisms in order to accomplish that goal. Uh, I'm trying to get my daughter to write a nice React app that will uh, let you do it by QR code. Um, but this school thing has been inconveniencing her. So uh, we'll, we'll see how fast we can get that done. Um, all right, so welcome to the second lecture. Um, this, in a sense, may be a lot of review. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to answer questions uh, and uh, you, know, you already know some of this stuff. Uh, but the first thing I want to talk about is the assessment. So the assessment has been released. Um, has everybody looked at it yet? No? OK. So make sure you look at it soon, um, just because you know, it is relatively complex. And uh, you know, I don't want it to sneak up on you. So at least take a look at it even if you're a procrastinator and want to leave the actual work towards the end, I understand, uh, just, but do look at it so you recognize how much work it, it will be. Uh, the, the, it kind of starts with math and then it works in, and then there's some Python of doing a neural network. Um, and please also, uh, you know, use the office hours, right? So if you, excuse me, if you have any questions or something's unclear or you're not sure if you should understand something or not, um, please uh, definitely reach out and, and chat with us. Um, so any questions on the assessment so far? I'm going to betting no, but I just thought I'd ask. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so um, Tom Mitchell, who is a relatively famous computer scientist, um, explains machine learning as a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and some performance measure P, if its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience E. Well, that's clear as well. Uh, anybody want to try to explain that? But you put it in your own words. All right, I'll try to paraphrase it. So basically, you're, you have uh, you know, a thing that it's doing, um, and it's learning to do it better over time through experience. Okay, so uh, you all recognize the term training, right? So what is training? But it's the same experiential learning uh, that you're in this class is about, but also that you've been doing all your whole lives, right? To figure out how to put your socks on, right? Um, you know, or tie your shoes, which I swear my youngest son still can't do consistently or well. He is 13. Um, so experience reinforces that learning. Uh, and we use a bunch of different mechanisms both as humans, but also as computers to be able to, uh, you know, kind of guide that learning, how we approach that learning uh, changes for the kind of thing you're trying to learn or the kind of task you're trying to do and for the kind of problem space that you're doing it in. Um, so as a little clearer version, um, this was always my running joke about machine learning. So when I was in college, uh, I actually worked in neural networks. Um, so because I really wanted to get into like AI as a as a field, um, things trans uh, you know conspired such that I ended up being mostly a software engineer. Uh, but I did do some some uh, like proper what I think of as proper AI. Um, and so my old joke has been that you know machine learning is really just fancy statistics, as you can see from our our image here. Uh, this is from a great source. Learn machine learning through memes um you know which if you like that sort of thing it was kind of amusing uh we'll skip the slide so you can see the url so joking aside what is the problem or distinguishing characteristic between machine learning and statistics why has this machine learning thing evolved uh kind of over statistics even though statistics have been around for i don't know probably thousands of years uh over the last i don't know let's just say 20 years machine learning has really started to become a thing. What's the, what's different between now or the last 20 years and let's say a hundred years ago when it comes to statistics? Any thoughts, ideas? Yeah. Sorry, it, that fan is so loud. So computing power has gone up, which is exactly totally true, but 
why does that mean we or that gives us an advantage but why do we need the advantage is what i'm getting at what do you all think a lot more data and segue thank you i'll give you the five dollars later um this is what we're looking at okay anybody here, here know how much a zettabyte is Yeah, I think I think so. We're mixing it up with exabyte. Um, it's a lot of data. All right. I actually, I should have put the other slide in here too. Um, I pulled this out of my other class, but basically, uh, you know, it's like the entire, all of the words like ever spoken by humanity is like one exabyte. I mean, it's like it's like ridiculous. So this is what we're seeing from a data growth. Okay. Does anybody have any theory as to why this data is growing like this? And I don't think I mentioned it in this class last time, but um, what are some ideas about, okay, so yeah, lots more people use computers. Sure, I'll give you that one. But any any kind of weirder theories? One more time. So, okay, so the argument is kind of like the data is modified. Let me kind of extrapolate a little bit from that. I'm going to say, so one of the things that companies are increasingly doing when they're doing software is you never delete. It's always an update. Okay, so in other words, like you always do, or like it's always a new record. You don't even update those. Like, so when you say location, right? So all of your phones are tracking where you are at all times, right? You imagine if you're writing a software system that wants to track your location, it's not replacing your current location every time, right? What it's doing is time stamping and inserting it on the record every time. Every time it gets an update, every whatever it is, some number of seconds, probably millions of seconds. So as a result, that data, now that everybody has phones, right? Now you've got, you know, I don't know what the penetration rate is, but let's say six billion people have phones constantly updating location. Right, so that's going to be a massive data flow. Um, the other thing, which may be more subtle and um, you may not be familiar with, is that uh, technology companies, in particular, but uh, also companies that where, in theory, software is not their primary business. Um, although, if you if you look at some thinkers on the subject, everything's a software company now. But you know what you think of as like banks and that kind of stuff. Most of them are recognizing that or believe whether it's correct or not it's kind of irrelevant but believe that the more information they collect the the better off they'll be in the future so in other words why are they tracking your location maybe they have no reason to okay but they track it because they can access the data and they may want to use it later Okay, so that also causes a huge amount of growth in that data is you not only are, like I said, kind of never doing updates or deletes, but on top of that, you're collecting all this extraneous data that you may want at some point. Okay, this is particularly true with uh, essentially logging. So like, you know, every time you visit a website, right, every time you use any, you know, piece of, uh, you know, web software or whatever, there's some record of your visit, right? That stuff is being compiled and saved off and, and you know with the potential to be used later. Sometimes it's really handy when you know you encounter an error and then you can go back and debug through it or whatever. But most of the time it's just kind of cruff, right? But it leads to this. Okay. And I would argue this is why machine learning became so prevalent over just, just statistics. Because you literally can't do stats anymore without to your earlier point a whole lot of computing horsepower you can't just do it on the back of an app anymore you got to use computers so as a result you have this kind of sort of new field around machine learning and data science to an extent as well so it's just kind of really important to remember that this thing is just kind of continuing to scale up and that you know and the, some of the reasons why and that why you care about being able to do this work and why things like, and we'll get into this a little bit later, why the efficiency of these mechanisms becomes so important, right? Like as soon as you, you know, as, as this keeps going, 
you got to get better and better and better at it, right? You can't just always rely on hardware improvement. Um, has anybody ever heard of Moore's Law? All right, what's Moore's Law? Right. A lot of people believe that Moore's Law is starting to be not true anymore. Okay, that they, you can't, you actually can't do silicon better. So you're seeing growth in things like quantum computing or parallel computing such that you can improve that efficiency, improve your calculations, et cetera, without relying on Moore's law. Um, although I did see, I don't know if anybody saw this article, everybody knows like cryptocurrency is kind of down lately. So supposedly that has led to a 10% drop in the price of GPUs. So if you need a new graphics card to play video games, now's the time to buy. Um, I just thought that was hilarious. Um, okay, so, there you go. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Um, yeah, so I think it goes petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte, uh, by the way. Um, but I can never remember. I usually have a cheat sheet to remember. Um, all right, so traditional programming. In traditional programming, what we do is we try to define the problem, and then we move on and we write some code that provides the rules for how to solve that problem. And then we, Build slide is kind of annoying. Um, then we see if did it work, verify uh, that it um, actually gives the outcome that we expected. And then if it does, then we deploy it and we call it going into production, right? And it actually works. Um, and, and if not, then we kind of look at the errors and we try to fix it. Um, so machine learning is similar, okay, except that this loop kind of always takes place. Arguably in traditional programming, it does as well. But even when you're in production, you want to bring that, that data, that work right back into your, uh, into your rule set, whatever, whatever way that's implemented, right? Um, so that you can continue to learn, right? Because to the, to the first definition, the way you get improvement using machine learning techniques or AI, right, is experience and then learning from it, not, you know, or the computer does, right? Not the human gets experience and writes better code, right? That's a pretty big distinguishing characteristic. Um, what I would, you know, jokingly say, right, is AI and machine learning are actually the epitome of what all programmers want. All programmers are super lazy and want to put themselves out of a job. So if you can build an AI that can do your job, then you can just get paychecks and, you know, watch TikTok and drink, you know, sodas in the back room. So, or as uh, has actually happened on a few times, uh, there's, this isn't quite the same, but there have been a number of programmers who have actually outsourced their job to a number of programmers through wage arbitration. Um, so where you can pay a software developer in a cheaper location than say the East Coast of the United States. Uh, so they take their whatever number of thousands of dollars a year, and then they just pay some people on like ODesk to do their job for them. Um, and arguably, that sounds like the perfect outcome for a programmer, right? Um, most of the companies that they worked for fired them for breach of contract. But, you know. Oh, as I mentioned, SKCD, very important in our field. Um, and so... This is kind of another way of saying with, you know, by comparison to kind of the traditional programming model, it's very straightforward, right? Um, when we're doing machine learning, it tends to be fuzzier, right? Um, you know, this is kind of like a joke, right? You stir the pile until it starts looking right. But in a sense, it's not entirely, uh, you know, neural networks have a, are particularly bad for this, but, you know, kind of things like overfitting, you know, as a concept. What are you doing to fix that? You're, you're kind of just jabbing at it, right? And throwing it around until you get it to do something different. Uh, you know, either through noise or jitter or something, some mechanism to try to get it to, you know, restabilize. Uh, one of the ways that was explained to me a million years ago, which I always liked, is, um, you know, imagine a plane, you know, like this desk in your head with some depressions in it. And what you're looking for constantly is the deepest depression. But it's really easy to fall into the, the less deep depressions, but getting out of it again is very difficult, right? So you want to make sure you're in the deepest one, but it's, all, it's often hard to know if you're in the deepest one or not. Uh, so this is where it gets 
you know, in a sense, it's a little bit more exper experimental or a little bit more kind of science um, than it is like traditional pure programming, because the only way you store the pile correctly is to some extent through experience. Right, so you gotta, you just gotta kind of work with it so you get it right. And then on top of that, um, the other challenge we have with machine learning today um, is that we don't know if our algorithm is necessarily right. Right, we may, we may need a whole different like path to try to solve this problem. Um, and so that can also be a big difficulty. So moving on to, you know, more about the machine learning approach. So what we do is we, you know, we look at the problem. So one of the things I do in my data science class, right, is you, you have to explore the data. You really need to get, as a human, you need to get some understanding of the data before you can really operate against it, which means there's a kind of a period of time when you're doing this work that doesn't look like you're producing anything. Right? Because all you're doing is trying to dig through it and understand what's there before you can move on to actually kind of making progress. So again, in, in some ways, this is why it's more like research or science in a sense than it is like traditional programming. Um, then, you know, I would argue maybe we have a picture in here of choosing an algorithm, um, you know, or maybe several algorithms. But then you have to train it with lots and lots of data. So the other thing, the you know, the unglamorous aspect of machine learning and data science in general is data cleaning. Okay. How many here have had to do data cleaning? All right, a little bit. Uh, you will experience that joy in this class. Uh, I pretty much guarantee it. Um, and this is, you know, it, it's certainly a pain. Um, it's gotten better. Um, if you haven't looked at it, actually, there's a great website called uh, Mockaroo, which lets you algorithmically generate data, uh, which is super nice. Um, so that when you know when your lots of data is not lots enough, right? Uh, you can start to maybe increase it by uh, generating new information. So then you train that algorithm, right? And then you build your solution. Then you take a look at the results of that solution, and depending on the algorithm, maybe that feeds back in, um, and then you kind of like. Okay, so I've got some conclusion, but you're never actually going to be done, right? You can always do better, um, pretty much, usually by increasing the data. So as you get through this, right, this pool right starts getting bigger in theory. So as a result, you can start to do better training using you know whatever technique. Um, yeah, questions so far. Okay. All right. So um, I feel like that's a typo. Why did just been supposed to be typed of ML? Um, I don't know. So, okay. This is really just like a laundry list that's an agenda for the rest of the slide. So, I'm not really going to touch on this too much. Um, but let's start with supervised learning. So, can anybody tell me the, the crux of supervised learning? What's the, what's, the, what's the characteristic of supervised learning is different from other, other kinds of machine learning? It has to apply uh, It has to. Yeah, so, uh, so there's an expert guiding it. Or this class, supervised learning, right? Um, so where theoretically there's an expert who's guiding the learning of the thing. And so in the case in, in kind of brass tax terms, when we talk about it in terms of implementing this, we say the labeling is correct, right? Or, or there is a labeling at all, right? Um, and so, uh, um, so we have our training data, right? And then we have, but we have labels for that data. And then, okay, so, okay, so what is a feature? Right, the reason I ask this is because in, in this world, machine learning and data science, the term feature means something different than it does in general software engineering. So what's a feature? Close. Any any other ideas? Yeah, yeah. I like the term characteristic. 
Um, so it's kind of like a characteristic of the of the thing, whatever it is. Um, and typically, when you when you pick up the word feature, it's one you care about versus random other characteristics, right? Um, so you check what those features are, and then you train your model, and then you get a model, and then you evaluate the model. How does it do? Um, and then when you want to do a prediction, so in other words, when you want to get a label that you don't have, um, you feed it through your model, and you get that prediction out of it, and you get new labels. Okay. And so some of these terms are matter, right? So um, you know we have our training elements, and then we have our labels for those elements. Or we have our testing element or actual like live data and what we're trying to get to is the labels when we're doing the testing right where we have the labels but we don't tell the system about it and we compare um the predictions basically to the labels that we know are correct so we can get an accuracy rating that's true for all of these but in learning this is kind of how it works does that make sense all right so like i said before hopefully this is largely review um but there may be some approaches that you haven't heard of before. All right, unsupervised learning. What do you think? Right, so the model generates the labels by itself, or arguably, when I'm preparing for this class, it is unsupervised learning, right? I'm going to go and teach something to myself, you know, because like any professor about anything, right? There's gaps in my knowledge about everything. So, or, you know, or I've forgotten about something because I haven't touched it in who knows how many years. So I'm going to go and do quote unquote unsupervised learning in advance of this class so that I have an idea of, you know, what I'm talking about so I can communicate it to you. And so, what, is, what does it mean that it's unsupervised, right? Is that I can theoretically learn something that is inaccurate. What is also interesting about unsupervised learning, though, is you can actually learn something that is, I don't know if I want to say like more accurate, but like, but like new accurate, right? Like something that a supervisor may not have been able to help you discover. So that's why sometimes unsupervised learning can be quite interesting because it may come up with new stuff. And this is where it gets closer, a lot of the time, where it gets closer to like proper AI, where it's doing its, the thinking not the human um and so by way of you know these are just some graphics from various places on the internet to try to you know kind of fix it in your head um but so you have a bunch of raw data and then it's going to try to interpret it using some algorithm and then process right and then you get the output the output here is just labels just like it was before um it's just that there's no uh there's no activity in here where you're teaching it about the labels. Now, all that said, right, there's usually an evaluation process over here that says, did it come up with the answers I expected? All right, so you usually will have some data that's actually going to test it, but not always. Um, you know, sometimes you want to just see what's going to come out. Um, and you got to be, this is also where it becomes difficult. You got to make sure you're choosing the right algorithms and the right approach. Uh, to make sure that you're not just getting, you know, it's kind of like the difference between like an association and causation, you know, like just because there was an association doesn't mean it's causal. It's kind of the same thing here is that you got to be careful that the outcomes you're getting are related to the original data. Um, when I was doing neural networks with HIV prediction, um, that I had this problem where, you know, I had a lot of unsupervised data or unsupervised learning um, and I got some conclusions during some of my experimentation. I got some conclusions that were not actually related to the input data. Um, so it's one of those things where it's kind of dangerous, gotta be careful of that. All right, and then brilliantly enough, we have semi-supervised learning. Um, and as you might imagine, this is kind of where you do a blank, right? And I would say, as with most things in kind of software development, um, doing a blend, is often better than taking any extreme right so um you usually get better outcomes this is often true in the world in general but you know moderation is key right um but so if you're if you think about them trying to do you know basically a partially 
supervised component and then an unsupervised component, and that might be a, a better way to approach it. Certainly a different way to approach it, but that's that's all this is. Um, so there's the semi-supervised. Any questions so far? Not quite sure how the camera is actually hitting my face. Um, all right. This one I think is is one of the weirder ones. So does anyone has anyone seen reinforcement learning before? All right. What's can you tell me a little about it? Or what like how's it majorly different than the first three? Yeah, yeah, sorry, go. Right. Okay. So basically you're, you're trying to almost like create a little world for your system to take place in and a set of actions may result in the outcome you want. So you need to find a way to kind of provide rewards in the system such that they collaborate and get to the outcomes you need. All right. Um, I would say the most common at least the place I've seen this the most office, often, you know, I don't know, this is a this is a hard thing where in, you know, academia may say one thing, but like in industry, it's used a lot of other ways. In industry, in my experience, um, you see this a lot with uh, what you usually refer to as like anomaly detection. Um, so you have this confluence of factors that are coming together to get to some outcome. So or like, um, you know, basically kind of looking at uh, negative scenarios is that you kind of have this thing triggered and that thing triggered and this thing triggered over there. So you should go and do this. All right, so that's kind of how I think of it. Um, I don't know, hopefully that helps. Um, and every time I see that, I think it's a QR code, but it's actually a maze, right? So, um, but basically, you're trying to work together. You're trying to create this environment where the outcomes you want are kind of based on a reward rather than, um, you know, than just kind of a binary yes, no, it's correct. All right. So, um, does everyone know what a batch is? I, I don't know how much this comes up for people these days because you don't. You don't talk about batch jobs as much in programming. Um, but so a batch is basically like, you, you know, it's kind of what it sounds like, I think, in, in natural English, where you're going to collect a bunch of stuff together and kind of process it all at once. Um, Hadoop, this is actually one of the biggest differences between Hadoop and Spark, and Apache Spark, right? I think it's Spark. I always mix that one up with another one. Um, but so one kind of works in big bulk activities, right? And one works on streaming techniques. Okay, so you know, uh, Apache Spark was originally developed to process the Twitter data feed, um, and so Twitter is obviously just continuously going. Whereas Hadoop was originally developed, I want to say actually for uh, bank, like doing bank work. I can't remember exactly, but basically stuff that doesn't have to happen in kind of as near real time. You have to use very different algorithms to process the data, and one may be way more effective than the other depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so as you can see, right, you, um, you know, this run and learn step usually is, is like as a batch. The thing that I want to show here too is online and offline. This is where some of the lingo and the slang comes in where it can be a little confusing because it's not 100% clear. Usually online means like I was describing like Apache Spark is that you might be treating them as batches, but it's coming from something at, at near real time. So like, um, instead of like doing every Twitter message, like at one, one, you know, one at a time, you might grab a hundred Twitter messages, then do those, then move on to the next hundred, okay? So it's still batch processing, but it's considered online because it's, it, it's continuously happening. Whereas offline typically means um, you get a bunch of them and you do it overnight. Okay. So, arguably, they're the same, right? Like, you know, it's just one's got a slower online list to it, but that's usually kind of what it means. 
Um, oh, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, how many of you are familiar with the term cron? Cron, C R O N. So um, batch actually comes from Windows world because the command line tool that you use to do this stuff was called batch. Um, in Linux and Unix world, the command line tool that you do this stuff with is called cron, uh, or sometimes lengthened to be cron tab. I have no idea what it like. Why is it called cron? Like I don't know. Is it short for something? Is it an acronym? I have no idea. Um, it just occurs to me now that I have no idea, so I've never looked it up. Um, but so if you see cron or cron job or cron like kind of in in usage, it's referring to the same kind of thing. It's largely a synonym. Make sense? Okay. All right, so instance-based learning. Um, when you are introduced to machine learning, this is often where you start, okay? Where basically the, you have a new thing that you want to figure out and you say, huh, it's near these other things, so it's probably the same, right? Um, and we got the next slide. I had, a, I had a cool, I found a cool article, like basically a description of like how you can tell the difference between instance-based learning and model-based learning. And so model-based learning is you come up with a model, right? And you can, um, you can kind of calculate to it rather than, uh, you know, it's just nearby these others. And the example that this person who, whose Nick is like Jev Oms maybe, um, described was like this person uh, was, you know, uh, runs a retail shop and wants to know in advance when somebody comes in the door, are they going to spend a lot of money or not? Okay. So their daughter comes up with the idea of, hey, maybe I could do some sort of prediction to figure that out. Um, and so what they do is they come up with a method that says, okay, if they have an expensive car and they have expensive clothes, then they uh, you know, are going to spend more than somebody who had a, a cheap car and cheap clothes. All right. However, the, the sample set is that town or whatever, the typical people who come into the shop. So now you have some visitor who's from some outlying place, let's say LA or Boston or New York, right? Where standards of living are much higher, they're much richer in terms of like real dollars. So they, instead of having an expensive car, which is a BMW, they actually have a Lamborghini or a Bentley, okay? So, and then their clothes are all, you know, shipped straight from a designer from Italy. So the problem is that if you look at their nearby neighbors, okay, or the people who are in the town who are relatively rich or well off, they are still an order of magnitude different in how much they spend, right? Because their well offness is also a scale. So that's where you might want to think about doing something like a model. Models handle kind of outliers or new things better than uh, something that has a relatively closed usual system. Does that make sense? I, don't know, I thought it was a pretty good example. Um, so, all right, so that was like a whirlwind tour of the, the bulk of the terminology. Um, I'm gonna ask again, any questions? Good. Has everybody seen all of these before? I hope, pretty much, okay. All right, so, I've mentioned a few things about this as we've kind of gone along. But the next thing we want to talk about is does machine learning make sense? Okay. Because um, one of the problems in the technology world, right, is when we get a shiny new toy, we like to use it for everything. Okay. And one of the, you know, what is jokingly referred to, one of the new shiny um, is machine learning. So, a lot of the time machine learning gets applied to places where it just doesn't belong. Um, you could <laughs> algorithmically figure out something, you know, like with some code that would actually solve 99% of your cases much more efficiently. Um, so yeah, the other thing I was gonna kind of mention too is like, this is another place where perfect is the enemy of the good. Another common problem in programming, right? Is that you're looking for perfect, especially when you, been mostly doing it kind of in college rather than in real world scenarios. 
where it's very easy to be tempted to say, oh, this solution isn't good enough because it's not perfect. Whereas in industry, when you're working in the space, that's usually not the right answer. Usually the right answer is, let's get to the 80% and fire an exception for the last 20%, right? So um, yeah, I don't, or I did talk about CDD in this class a little bit, you know, test-driven design, you do all the, the tasks that you think are worthwhile and then you write an implementation for those tasks. If someone comes along and fires something at your method that does not, you know, was not in your test set, the right answer may be an exception, not implementing that case, okay? So machine learning seriously suffers from this. Um, so, you know, if, if you're dealing with a deterministic or a stochastic process, do you know the underlying effect of function that represents the idea um, or it represents the data? Sorry. So these are indicators that machine learning might be the right answer. Okay. Um, and then validity and this is one of those words I don't say out loud very often, uh, ergodicity. Um, you know, are they rational? You know, these are like indicators, right? Um, and the ramifications of the model part, right? This is the Part, this is where things like bias and things like that also come in where you kind of like does what the model is spitting out or, or like my stupid example from when I was in college is what the model is spitting out actually based on the inputs, okay? And is what the model is spitting out what we actually want to know, which is also not always the same thing. So again, you know, big difference with machine learning and kind of general programming there's a lot of thinking component to it, right? That is not straightforward. It's, that's not just, you know, I need to, you know, I need to get point A to point B. There's a lot more kind of like surrounding information that you need. Um, and then this, this one here, this uh, deploying an ML pipeline, this is the big reason why you want to find another solution first, okay? If, if there's another way to accomplish this, machine learning is probably not worth the effort because it's so much more expensive, both in time, computational resources, excuse me, and then in particular in people, right? That if you can avoid it, you're probably better off, right? Which, I mean, you obviously can't, right? But make sure that what you're getting out of it is the realistic cost of what you're putting into it. Um, which is one of those things you can get glossed over a lot, in particular, the people cost, for example. You know, this is why you don't see the prevalence of um, Haskell as a programming language in industry. Why? Well, it may or may not be suited to all scenarios in the world. Is anybody in here a Haskell fan? Not too bad. I always like a fight. Um, so Haskell may or may not be good at doing whatever. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it is good at finding Haskell people is very expensive. They just, they don't grow on trees, right? The reason most shops use Java, C Sharp, Python is because everybody does. Same is true here. Machine learning is a relatively rare skill, partially why some of you are interested in it, I'm sure. Um, but so, but building an ML pipeline is not a trivial exercise, both in terms of people and time. So make sure that's getting, doing what you think it's doing. I mean, and finally, is there a clear objective? This goes back to that research component. And, and to some extent, um, this kind of ramifications part, like, um, do you actually understand the outcome you're looking for? Like, do you actually know, you know, kind of going way back to the labels part, like, are the labels you're getting out of this actually useful? Do you actually have an objective? Do you actually know what you're doing? So, you know, don't get me wrong. I put a lot of caution in here because tech industry tends to be very buzzword focused. Um, and so ML is very buzzwordy in that regard, but that doesn't mean it's bad. And it doesn't mean that it's not great for certain kinds of things, but because it is a buzzword, you gotta be really careful about people wanting to apply it when it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, particularly like as a consultant or something like that, like the last thing you want to do is you have a client or a or you know a future job or whatever to hire you 
because they want you to build something using machine learning, but they're telling you machine learning is the right answer. And then you get three quarters of the way into it and realize, oh, I could have done this much more easily. Because that, that's how you don't get new jobs with same client, right? All right, so challenges with the machine learning, um, which these ones I think are all pretty obvious. Um, and we've talked about them, but insufficient data, um, this is the most common one, right? Uh, so there's various mechanisms to try to fix that, uh, you know, by either generating new data or by uh, breaking up your data such that you kind of sort of have more data. Um, then it's sampling bias, right? Talked about that a bunch of times. Noise in the data, overfitting, underfitting, and poor feature selection. So is, is what you're looking for not really a great choice based on the data you have? Make sense? All right, I'm going, it's a, I feel like I covered that a lot already, so I'm not going to go over that too much. Um, and this is, there's a lot of cautionary tale in here, right? So um, this example, right, is, um, I think, I, I don't know, I think it's a little hard to parse, but basically what, what he's trying to say is like, if there is a frontline community health care worker uh, in India who's in front of the problem, right? but their expert machine learning system or whatever tells them to do A, but they really feel like they should do B. Silicon Valley, in other words, the machine learning system is gonna win every time. Even if B was the right answer and the person who's on the ground knows better, right? Um, another classic example is, you know, autonomous driving. Um, you know, you're starting to see like Tesla's rolling out with autonomous driving already. Uh, there's a number of problems here. One is, does the tech work well, right? That's kind of almost the simplest one. Can it drive the car, right? But you start to run into other kinds of problems as well, is that, you know, one of the big ones that was debated kind of in the public consciousness, I want to say with it, it was certainly within the last year, but the ethical dilemma, right? So is the car's occupant more important than a pedestrian? So if you have to make the choice, how do you decide? The other question is like, where, where does the, um, you know, can the human override what the computer is doing? They can at present, most of the time, um, but will they be always able to do that? Does it, you know, that's where it starts to get dangerous is, Oh, and actually the example I was gonna to give to a minute ago was, um, does anyone, I'll give a number, um, it was in my notes. So does anybody know, that, or anybody heard about the Boeing 737 MAX problem? All right, so basically there was a plane just got rolled out um, and it had a very, or has a very sophisticated, um, let's say AI for its autopilot, right? Um, the problem is, is that the pilots can't override it under some conditions. And so the software thought the plane was going up. The pilots who were looking out the window could tell that it was going down, but they couldn't override it. So the plane crashed. And I think it happened a bunch of times. So they, they actually uh, took it off the market, retooled it, everything. I think they just started rolling them out again. Um, that's another example, right? Is like, it's usually better to have a human as a fail state, not the other way around, right? Um, and then I have no recollection of why I put this slide in. Oh yeah, let's just move on. Um, so let's talk about this as a little bit of an example, right? So. How do humans recognize fruit? Uh, any ideas? Color, shape, okay, what else? Texture, you have one? Right, so uh, some supervised learning there, right? Um, so they have some history with it. Uh, any other things? 
I think there's a big one that none of us can do right now because we're all wearing masks. Smell, taste, um, those are other ways. So in the computery world, right, we got to think about the fact that we, we have a much more limited set of senses, right? So we, we do need to think about like, how do we uh, gather enough information about our environment without being able to provide the same level of quality of kind of environmental knowledge as a human has, especially all this stuff that, and this is where that bias stuff really mixes in, all that stuff you don't even think about, right? We don't even realize, like, you know, when was the last time you recognized a banana based on the smell? Well, probably never. It's got such a distinct, uh, bleh, distinct look compared to, say, an orange that you don't even you don't smell it, right? But if you had an orange and a grapefruit, arguably, you might want to smell them to tell the difference. Sometimes, um, so we need to think about kind of all those different uh, components when we're trying to build these, uh, you know, systems. Right? It's like recognizing our biases both in terms of like the you know the bad kinds of biases right like racism socioeconomic and all those things that we hear about all the time but also those biases that are i've been operating as human for quite some time now and i do a whole bunch of stuff i don't even think about right um all right but so moving on from there uh i would say that hopefully you have experience with at least Let's say 80% of these. Does that seem appropriate? Everybody played around with, you know, TensorFlow and Keras. I can never say that. It's one of it. So the problem I have is like I read stuff a lot and never say them out loud. And so I forget how they're supposed to be pronounced. Um, and then scikit learn. Um, how much experience do you all have with Python versus uh, R? Have you done a lot of, like, does anybody do a lot of R? All right, cool. All right, because this is mostly going to be um which uh it's really taking over the world i you know um i don't know if they would have taught this to you anywhere along the way but you know what a set a set based language or a set theory language is versus a general purpose language so you're all familiar with sql right um so sql and r are both set languages so they're very very good at working with sets okay and sets in the mathematical sense set um Whereas general purpose languages are less good at working with sets, but it's because they're good at working with everything. So the reason you're seeing Python really take off is because R is a set based language. And so it tends to be, it tends to get nichified, right? Whereas with Python, it's like, I know Python, so I can write a website. I know Python. Oh, I can do data science. Oh, I can do machine learning. Um, so because it's general purpose, people do a lot more stuff with it. The flip side of that is typically, um, Python, for example, will be way less than something like R, but that is heavily changing. Um, mostly, uh, we'll say, and I have friends who actually work, uh, you know, are committers to Python. Um, they're working hard, right, to make this less true. But kind of at the end of the day, if, if everything in the world was perfect, which we know it's not, R should outperform Python in all cases related to kind of mathematical manipulation at the end of the day, just because of the way it's that doesn't mean you should use it. I'm just saying that's that's part of why it was originally so popular and Python is catching up. All right. Um, so has anybody ever heard of the NFL theorem? This is unrelated to sports ball, which is an old Calvin and Hobbes reference. Do we know what sports ball is? All right, so Calvin and Hobbes, do you, do you know what Calvin and Hobbes is? All right, so Calvin and Hobbes is a comic strip from way back. It's really very funny. If you've never seen it before, I highly recommend it. But it's about this kid and mostly his tiger, um, and he does all kinds of crazy things. He is just about as interested in professional sports as your average pro stereotypical program. Okay, so he refers to all sports as sports ball um, with no understanding of the difference between them. So this is not related to American football, but in fact, the no free lunch theorem. Um, so in other words, it's like, yeah, it's machine learning. Yeah, it's AI. That doesn't mean it's magic. 
right? And so that's kind of what it's getting at. It's just make sure you understand what you're getting yourself into and what you're expecting out of it. There's no free lunch. Um, and then let's see. I think this might be our last slide. Um, okay, so one of the things that we want to talk about here, right, is like approach it as a software engineer. You know, um, don't approach it as uh, you know you just know everything at the outset. I think one of the keys of a software engineer, right, is a strong ability to Google and use Stack Overflow, right, and use it effectively. Use open source, right, um, and use it legally, but point being is like you shouldn't be approaching machine learning as if it's some kind of special sauce magic thing you just it's just another tool in your toolbox and the better you get with it the more experience you have with it the, the less often you have to google um but you'll make faster and easier and cleaner choices when you're working with this stuff um generally speaking and i think it's been pretty clear from some of the earlier slides you know your go-to answer should not be machine learning for most scenarios we have pre-populated the projects for this class such that it is true but generally speaking you know look for another solution first because it'll usually be cheaper and better um if if possible um and then build with reproducibility in mind this is another programming thing right in the sense of you know like what you deliver should be replicable should be usable should be upgradable by somebody else right you don't you don't build you know software and this is one of the kind of failings right about being able to teach how you teach software development and stuff it's all about teams one of the reasons at least and i don't know this to be true for sure but this is one of the theories that was told to me is that there's the reason many software engineering companies favor Amer uh, students from american universities is because of the focus on team versus universities elsewhere in the world. Um, and I definitely agree where people who are used to working with teams, people who play well with others are ones I wanna hire, right? Um, I don't know if American universities do a better job of that than other places, not my bag, but I do know that teams matter. Um, and so part of being part of a team is the wider community, right? So giving back to open source, you run into a problem, you file a bug with them, right? And then when they ask you for more information because it wasn't clear the first time, you answer, right? When you write code, you put in comments, you put in documentation, you try to think about the problems that somebody else will have with it. These are the kind of people I wanna hire. Um, yeah, and then, you know, keep it simple as long as you can. Has anybody ever heard of the, the KISS acronym? Um, it's a throwback to my youth, you know, so keep it simple, stupid. Um, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're doing this kind of stuff. The simpler you can make it, the better the, better the outcome will usually be. Um, and then don't be afraid to include humans. Um, so this is another example of that 80-20 rule problem. Um, it is a, a common thing, right, where you're, let's say you have, a, you know, a, some sort of system where you know, they're processing money for, uh, you know, some retail bank or something. Um, and you can automate like your bank, the, like, uh, sorry, like stock trades, you can automate ACH transfers, um, you know, whatever, but there's this one vendor that you can't. Probably not trying to figure out how to write that 20%, just hire somebody to do that last piece. Right? So the same is true when we're thinking about these kinds of problems. If your model doesn't work for the last 20%, find a way to know what that 20% is and find a different way of solving. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, you know, this is not a mathematical proof. It doesn't have to be pretty in the sense that your completeness to solve the problem, any individual piece of it should be pretty. But it doesn't mean the whole thing has to be one unified theory of the universe, right? One of my most uh, kind of influential events was, does everyone know the traveling salesman problem? I'm sure you've covered that at least a little bit, but I was actually at the math conference where the guy keynoting was, his announcement was he had solved it. 
right? And the way he solved it was he brute forced the last 20% using a computer. So now we have a solution to the traveling sales problem that's made up of like theorem A, theorem B, theorem C, and then a whole bunch of tables of results, right? Not pretty at all as a collective, but any individual piece is nice. And most importantly, it solves the problem, right? So now FedEx and UPS, you know, I mean, FedEx have changed their business. It might even have made their business. Uh, I think that was my last slide. Questions? All right, I will reiterate, um, look at the assessments um, before the last minute. Uh, they will take a bit of work um, and, you know, reach out, uh, definitely reach out if you have any trouble like trying to submit it to. Um, this is the first time I've ever tried to submit something like that through Blackboard. So for all I know, I screwed something up. Um, but otherwise we're good.